Hello, NFT land. I'm Creatorius Rex, and I'm here for another edition of The Twin this week in NFT news. And we're going to talk about a lot of things beyond the topics that we normally talk about because there's just a lot going on. And it's all these different types of things that aren't necessarily trends. And my co-host, Scott Leach, is going to comment on all of them. Scott Leach, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Okay, so we're going to start right. off today talking about meme NFTs and the meme NFT of the moment, Emperors. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about fine artists, Takashi Murakami's in the news. We're going to talk about brands, Budweiser. Uh, just another step, but like maybe laying out the a roadmap or a blueprint to emulate uh, for other brands or to at least consider. Um, might even bring up a, a, a little change in the Robato's ecosystem, which I thought was interesting for maybe our more traditional PFP projects. So we've got fine art, we've got PFP, we've got brands, we've got memes, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about what is art and what artists should be doing, because this is a topic that nobody's talking about in any meaningful way. And it's, uh, it's really interesting because the question is, who is creating art? How will artists succeed in this space? Or is it really just going to be a bunch of DGens out there to pull the rug on the rest of us? So that is the setup for today. Scott Leach, you want to get right into M first? Or do you have something you want to talk about first? No, let's get right into it. I'm ready. Okay, M first. If you don't know about him, M F E R S, you can guess what it is supposed to mean or is it an abbreviation for. Uh, this came out in November of 2021. Uh, mint price was 0.069, I believe, at the price of Ethereum at that day. They raised a little over $3 million in their mint. This was at a time when we would have called uh, the NFT recession of the fall of 2021. Um, it was towards the time when it was going to be thawing, but it was still in that. But we have this meme NFT. And a meme NFT, we'll talk about it a little bit. You can see some examples in this. Uh, where, you know, it's just basically a little squiggle drawing, leaning back. Some of them are smoking a cigarette. They all have headphones on. They're sitting at a computer. It's basically a meme of NFT traders, of crypto traders, crypto bros, however you want to think about it. Okay. So this idea that it started as a meme is really important. And by the way, I mean, this is like a really popular, um, a really popular collection. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think at one point the floor was at like 60th. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say it's um, between one and three right now, but I can't remember because it's been changing a lot recently. But there's this whole idea that it started out and it had anonymous founders. Or it had, and there was like an anonymous founder, Satoshi. And it's a play on Satoshi. People are, you know, like their Bitcoin history. And, uh, we started seeing a couple months ago these tweets about people in the community or active in the Emperor community, you know, talking about this idea of Satoshi maybe fading away like Satoshi did. And, you know, maybe all these things that would make it like the perfect, I don't know if it would be the end of the project, because it's not the end of the project. It's the perfect, I don't know what we would call it, the end of the beginning, something like that. And people can read what's on here, uh, you know, but, but it's almost like people are trying to set this up. Is it idle chatter or is this all planted to culminate in what happened yesterday? And what happened yesterday was the end of Sartoshi. And by the way, Sartoshi NFT on Twitter is gone. It was, was semi-active. Uh, pretty active Twitter account, uh, had a lot of followers. Now, what you're seeing here is this GN Emphers. It's, it's kind of a version of the GM Emphers, uh, something that was done, I think it was in October of last year, and actually led to this whole idea of the Emphers and, and what that would be and that type of thing. So, But Sartoshi basically said, it's the end of an era, like Satoshi, I'm going away. And guess what? I'm going to give all of the proceeds of secondary sales back to the community because that's what I want. I want it to be a self-sustaining community. Now, all of the 
uh, proceeds of secondary sales is actually 50%. Um, so they're giving away 50%. They're giving it to some community members, which we'll go into in a second. 25% will still go to Sartoshi. Uh, 15% will go to the developer. As he said, that's part of the contract he had with the original developer who created the contract. Uh, so can't get around that. And then there was someone who did business development, something like that. Uh, marketing who gets 10%. So 50% goes to maybe three people, but I can't really tell because mm-hmm. that third person might be multiple people. But in any event, 50% goes there and 50% go back to the community. Okay, what's the community? It was a basically a headless um, community at one point. Seven Emperor founders created a private Discord for Emperors. They created, eventually created a, a multi-sig seven-part wallet, and they became maybe the de facto stewards of the market. You know, where Sartoshi wasn't really guiding it, but was just coming in around there, and then they created a structure. So what Sartoshi says is that fifty percent is actually going to that that wallet that has the the, the multi-sig from the seven different people, and they'll decide what's going to do that. That's what he calls the that's what he calls the uh, community. Okay. I've done a lot of setup here. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts so far? It's, it's really interesting how we're seeing all this, these kind of use cases happen in real time and how something that in another project would be perceived as a rug is, is sounding like a, a sort of, brilliant move by the creator or somehow a uh, like they're above it or something or they're moving on because it just has that vibe of um i don't know they're doing something right something righteous in some way uh i guess giving the rights makes sense and and under or, or giving the royalties makes sense and understanding those splits makes sense um wallet addresses are really hard to know who's actually who's those are and, and what's what uh, I've said before, like a little bit of transparency is sometimes terrible because it gives you lots of ideas of what's going on, but without seeing the whole picture, it creates a uh, sort of Petri or like just hotbed for crazy theories. Right. Um, I don't know. On the one hand, I love the idea that, that someone can make a project and leave it assuming the project didn't, originate with this promise of a giant roadmap and in some future and they're just bolting you know um it's interesting i never i never got one of these one of these i I watched from the sidelines for a while um it always felt like there's a thing that happens where when communities form there's that high barrier to entry and if you're in the know and you know the sort of language and the the story behind the art and the memes and and what GM means. It's like all the things that we experience getting into NFTs. And then when you get into these smaller communities of projects and you're in the know, it's really empowering, right? And being able to sort of have this, this group of people in the know. And if you're on the sidelines, there's this awareness of like, oh, there's something going on there I don't quite understand, but it seems like they have their whole own thing. It's what's going on with the Goblin Town WTF stuff. Um, this <laughs> yeah, sort of I like, haven't really been following Goblin Town, so you might you might illuminate us there. But I think that basically there are these projects, and maybe Goblin Town is one of these, that um, there are people who clearly know more than others. There are people yeah. who are clearly misleading others. And if you don't understand who the players are and what their objectives are and what their plan is, you're just exit liquidity. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the part that's, um, I mean, money complicates all this stuff, right? Cause you're, it's hard to know what anyone's motivation is for anything. Um, the idea of creating, I think it's fascinating, the idea that I could create some sort of IP as an NFT and then step away from it as the creator of that and let other people benefit from transacting on it. So I don't just like 
or even if I am the one who benefits, if I was a, an artist and just said, I'm designing a bunch of 3D characters, if you if you buy these, you get the 3D model, go nuts and do whatever you want with it. I get a few percent every time you sell it, but you can make movies, whatever, but I'm not, that's it. That's all it is. It won't ever be anything more than that unless someone chooses to make something else with it. Um, that's interesting to me because I think there's still all this potential with this technology to do things we haven't conceived of yet in terms of creating content and rights management and things. But well, this, this whole thing of like leaning into mystery, like it's a, like it's cool when really it's creating an atmosphere for a massive amount of liquidity and someone to benefit from that liquidity and someone else to be exploited. Um, yeah. I think if you're in these things, you you should be in it for the entertainment value, because um, yeah. chances are you're not going to be in it for any type type of investment benefit. Yeah, because um, there's a very limited number of people who actually know know what's going on in many of these. Um, there is this this other tweet that came up, um, and this is one of a couple. Um, but you know, Sartosi's a serial rugger. Um, he's been doing all the, der der the derivatives of emperors pulled the rug and said goodbye. There's another person who said, this is pretty amazing that, uh, Sartoshi's doing a, a really slow rug here and he's minting a whole nother collection open edition on his way out and basically pocketed 1.5 million on the way out the door. Um, which I, I guess in some ways is like brilliant. Um, and you know, maybe, Maybe it's someone who has all the best intent in, in the world. Uh, but sure. there's a lot of people who uh, believe that this is just basically another scammer. Yeah, yeah. And the, I mean, the thing is, like, the community will decide, right? So if this community decides they like it, it doesn't, at that point, does it matter if, the, if they're a scammer or not or what their intentions were? The community now has the project and they're choosing whether it wins or loses. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, well, and well, that's and then something then, in this space that I think is super unique that a project can be kind of hijacked by its community in a way. Um, yeah. And this is different. I mean, I, then I think like, okay, so the seven, you know, I, all these people are anonymous, right? So the seven mm -hmm. people who are part of this wallet, is it really seven people? Is it one person? Is it two people? Is it three people with multiple wallets? I don't, you know, okay. So let's say it's seven people. Um, are, were they part of it from the beginning? Are they com are they completely arm's length from from the founder? What does this mean going forward? Is this just a way to enable them to get better exit liquidity on whatever their holdings are? Uh, but you know, now that the fact that they own fifty percent of the royalties, um, and I want to say oh, I'd have to look back. I can't remember the number, but they've done a lot of secondary on Emperor's. Um, so I want to say it was you know, over a million in secondary as well that they've earned. And there's no reason why that like if someone was a steward, they couldn't, you know, generate another million dollars in secondary that they would have control over. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, and you and I have talked about that. We talked about this in, uh, was it August, September, somewhere around there. <laughs> I talked about this with a few people. There was a project, a particular project that was a, that was a rug and, uh, but it had actually a cool concept and a cool community. So we thought about, you know, what would it be like to rescue it? In mm -hmm. this case, it wasn't like a, a nice seamless transition handover, but, um, you know, could we go in and just like rescue it? But, you know, in the end, we wouldn't have owned the contract. So it, it would have been problematic. So we decided not to do it. Yeah, that that's the part that's going to be interesting is I feel like that's got to be coming. Like someone's going to find a way to do that where you can pass absolute ownership over to some other well, you can do that individual. Yeah. So, so, so I think, change, change the admin, right? Sure. But I, I I'm saying that I, I feel like that's going to be a, a format we see emerge is. Oh yeah. It's like what we're seeing now with these free mint projects, like what, what goblin town was. So they, it's super fascinating, right? It's like sort of an obvious iteration that, Oh, well it's a free mint. So now secondaries go bananas because, I got it for free and I can sell it for 0.1 ETH. Like that was just easy money for someone, right? Um, 
Yeah, but like but that creates its own sort of why does it create a secondary market? Why does a free mint create a secondary market? Because it doesn't always. There's been other free mints. No, though. it doesn't always. It has to catch that lightning in a bottle moment, right? Where it gets enough attention and emphasis. But I, I feel like there's a lot of um it's sort of algorithm gaming and then influencer influencers playing a role. And who knows who's but I mean, there's been so much stuff with goblin town and who might be behind it um even before people started taking credit for it this there was something else happening behind the scenes i think that drove people was taking that. credit for goblin town yeah if you look at oh, some of his it. tweets um yeah why because did he meant a lot of them or i don't so i don't want to say anything that could be construed one way or another because i okay. i honestly don't know but people did a tweet saying for his daily art it was called uh i am the i am the founder and it had it was had goblins in it and he had been poking at goblin town for a while and it created this whole like so are you or aren't you and then like he did another tweet after that that was someone or someone else did a tweet where they he was collaborating with someone or something and said they were making goblin sounds together. Whatever it was, it, it kept alluding to like, I am the one who, this is my project. Um, I haven't looked in the last few days to see what the latest news on that is, but it was getting really, um, I don't know, confusing, misleading. Yeah, I mean- it, it was hard to tell what was going on. It would be dangerous for someone like him to do that with someone else that he didn't know. Uh, because who knows what they're going to do with that project. And it, it might be really hard for him to unwind this. If there's, if a general perception comes up that he's associated with it in some way and he's not, yeah. and then it turns out yeah. to be trouble. Everyone's going to read everyone's, no one's going to know the correction later that he's not part of. Yes. It. Yes. My, so that's when I, I actually thought after looking at it, I thought, oh, and this really must be him. Um, yeah, it's interesting because it doesn't seem like his style. It doesn't. But if you look at, um, I don't know if we talked about this before. If you look in close at those goblins, they're, um, and the, it's like my art degree paying off, like the, the way that it's drawn, the line quality, whoever drew that knows how to draw whether you like the style or not you can tell that it's someone that that knows how to draw knows how to illustrate um it would be weird for a rug project to hire someone that knows how to illustrate for a rug project. you know what i mean it was a strange that always yeah. struck me as an oddity because it's a very specific style that's not necessarily well, it could be a trained like, illustrator well, that's leading the rug project, right? I mean, that's a possibility. It could be. That just seems like a weird skill set to me, <laughs> that you could be a trained illustrator and a good rug person. Not to say that all artists are have integrity or all ruggers have no talent as an artist, but <laughs> it just seems like a weird mix of skills to be good at both those things. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> or could it could be that they just hired someone off of Fiverr and they happened to get somebody who was just very skilled. They just happened to be from a low Actually, wage. I could be teacher. totally wrong. Maybe the best artists are ruggers. That's the whole, that's how you become a <laughs> well, that, that, there is a Picasso's there is, thing about stealing. That's right. There about is, there stealing is, great art. You know, is art, it does art have value. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, yes. Are they all? Yeah. Strong? Anyway, it was a, it's, it, we're getting into this weird, I don't know. It's it's exciting. Like all these mysteries are exciting, but it's also like when you see the market the way it is and you see people jumping into these projects and knowing that someone somewhere is is getting exit liquidity. You I mean that's that's the name of the game right now. There's not a lot it is. That, there's not a lot of Warren Buffett's in out there. There's a lot of danger. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's like the, I don't know, I just like the, this mix of, and I'm 
just on a soapbox now that has not not even um, this mix of like oh we don't want oversight we don't want you know this is ours government stay away and then like the amount of fleecing that's happening like come on man if you yeah. if we believe in it then like let's do let's do uh, something good fleecer, together yeah, you don't want gov- you don't want government oversight but like even honest yeah. people sometimes don't want government oversight um no and i think that that's yeah i think it's just like we either have to i don't know okay so my uh my sense is that um Emperors, which I think is kind of a cool project. Uh, meme, you know, like it's sort of the quintessential meme project in, in many ways, just based on its success and what it's done so far. Um, but yeah, I think it's a scam. Uh, so, I mean, but does it doesn't it, mean does it, it wasn't valuable to the people who were yeah. involved in it, either because they traded in and out and made money or because they just had fun with it, right? And it's just, it's just an expensive yeah. entertainment option. The thing is, I don't, does it matter if it's a, if you don't promise something this is the thing that's yeah, I'm marveling about something. with, yeah. with um, the new Freemint projects where they all say like no discord, no, no roadmap. This is it. This is all you get. Yeah. And that people still jump in on it. Is that. I don't think that's a rug if if they leave. Like they said what it is. I think it's it's opportunistic that you're capitalizing on this enthusiasm and this yeah, this sort of, in fact, air what it of might mystery, be, but it depends though. It depends on if you you could do all the things you said, but still have nefarious intent. And you don't directly yes. raise expectations, although I think you could argue that this did do that, yeah. but you could do it through proxies. So other people that are early token holders yeah. could could yeah. wind up doing yeah. it and and i think that that's pretty powerful and i and we've certainly seen that i mean we saw it with influencers for sure but mm-hmm. we've seen that in all sorts of discords where there's a half a dozen people sometimes they knew each other beforehand sometimes they did not but they met through the process yeah. and they get together and they they pump and then eventually all dump at the same time um so okay Let's move on. So yeah. that's interesting because I think we're going to come back to these themes anyway. So I thought we would talk just really quickly about something completely opposite end of this. So not the meme, but the brand. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, the brand. In this case, Budweiser. So Budweiser did their cans last fall. Um, and that was actually among the brand drops. It was one of the better ones, I think. It was like something like 2,500 cans. Now... They are, um, and they did something not too long ago where they did the Budweiser Pass. We talked about that. I think it was like three ninety nine or something like that. Well, what does the Budweiser Pass get you? Well, it got you. I think it was related to the Dwayne Wade thing, where they had the special cans with Dwayne Wade on them. But it's certainly involved in this. Um, And this is uh, a partnership with Zed Run. Zed Run, as many of you know, was a very popular gaming NFT project last year. It's far less popular these days, but it was a. It, there was money involved. You could breeding races. It wasn't just selling your NFTs, but more like mm-hmm. Axie Infinity. You competed and you could win prizes by winning. And so there was the, all these like complex mechanisms about breeding stock and how you had the best horses that then you could lend out to people for races. You could race them yourself. You could sell them, all these things. Well, in any event, you know, the Clydesdale is the Budweiser's iconic mm-hmm. image. It's mascot. Um, seems pretty good. And what they're going to do is they're, they're going to have, I think, 2,500 of them uh, that are going to be in the Zed Run ecosystem. They're going to have competitions. I think we see on, on here the July uh, Challenge 1, September Challenge 2, uh, and there's, you'll be able to win. Um, you'll be able to win prizes for you know having the Clydesdale that wins. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's one thing I will say that's very interesting. That's uh, maybe I'll say two things. So first of all, Budweiser seems to be sort of hitting some really good notes, right? I think it's it's it, these are interesting engagements, um, activations they're having, and this one with a gamification element. Seems like on brand. I mean, I think the only the only other thing I would say is the risk here is that Zed Run hasn't always had a pristine relation or um, uh, pristine reputation. There were a lot of people that were 
uh, maybe compromising the system. And there's, they had some other issues with the project. Um, but that was last year. This is this year. <laughs> so um, maybe they're beyond that, but it's, it seems like a good mm -hmm. fit and like theoretically, as long as they don't get tied in with some sort of downside as that run. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I feel like over the last month or two, I was always the one when we talked about these brands and NFTs was always like, you know, against it and frustrated and thought they had like, shouldn't be messing around here. And now as we go on and we see more of these questionable projects, I, it's neat to see that brands are trying stuff in this space. Um, and especially collaborating with other projects and it's neat to see an old project come back kind of and, and yeah get sure. some attention i mean to your point i don't know the full extent of, of any sort of shady goings on but assuming that that's the the people running the project are still on the up and up as far as we know i think it's cool that that this is happening and we talked about it, I think last week, last time we talked, and we saw it at, at VCon. The like the Stoner Cats project was one that I got excited about at VCon, even yeah. though I was like, "Oh, here come the celebrities to come into NFTs," yeah. and like, "Well, shit, they're actually doing something, and it looks interesting." And um, let, let's just yeah. say Stoner Cats among celebrity projects is an anomaly. <laughs> Most of true, the celebrity projects true. Are but I mean, of the yeah, of the of the celebrities who are doing. I'm not talking about the celebrities who sort of have the marketing person that's telling them to get into NFTs, but the celebs that seem to know about it and are actually building content around it, like um, like Stoner Cats, like the stuff that that uh, Kevin Smith was talking about. Um, it's just interesting to see these these folks actually. So, so this goes stuff. back to the, my concept of entertainment or consumption versus investment. And I think that yes. what we're looking at with Budweiser is this is more consumption slash entertainment type of project. So if you buy into it, you'll get some things out of it just from an entertainment value standpoint. Yeah. Um, whether this is valuable from an investment standpoint, whether the, the value increases over time, I would think shouldn't matter as long as over time you're getting some value out of it. So for example, you know, VCon uh, or V Friends you know, essentially started out as a consumption oriented uh, mm -hmm. uh, NFT because it, at the very least, we could look at it and we could say, oh, okay, well, geez, you know, I'm going to, I get to go to three conferences. What would be the price yeah. to go to a conference? At least a thousand dollars, maybe more for something like this. And so if I spend $3,000 on this, oh, well, I'm just prepaying for three years of event tickets. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, this is one of my favorite parts about this technology that I think is super cool is you can start with something that is, is one of those models. It's a sort of consumption model, but then you can flip that. What Gary and that team has done where, okay, this pass gets me access, but then we saw the thing at the show, right? So I held a V friend, I got a V friend V con ticket. That's a separate NFT that I use that ticket. Now that ticket step is going to get me into a future collaboration with Snoop and Gary details forthcoming or, or whatever, but, and who knows what that will be. But the fact that that's happening is interesting, right? Cause you're now taking an, uh, this NFT was intended for one particular thing. That thing is over now, but the creator can, can use it again. Yeah. Absolutely. That's really, it's yeah, that's super fascinating. I think it's what we saw, and I've heard Gary say this about some of the V Friend Series ones, like the gift goats being kind of like his pass. It's it's like the proof pass to me. That was, a, I think that's starting to emerge as a type of NFT, which is, I'm a, a creator, or or this is a project, and we're probably going to do lots of things. We don't necessarily know what they all are. So here's our pass NFT that's going to get you into those things, and those future things when they mint, you're going to have first crack at them. Um, but those yeah. things we mint, well, who knows what those will be? Maybe they will be content. Maybe they will be investments. Yeah. yeah I, think, I, I love that. I think it's cool. Right. And it, so we have this concept of entertainment um, consumption. And, and actually this next uh, thing we want to bring up. So we talked about meme. We talked about brand. Now we'll talk about like a traditional PFP project. Um, not that Memphis was not a PFP project, but this one is, is like a different 
focus. It's more entertainment. They're gaming. They're creating a Robotos like metaverse game. Um, they have all these different ways to dress it up, right? There's all of these interactive activities around Robotos. Uh, so I think that's interesting. Now, the evolution here is that uh, they just partnered with Rarible to create a, their own marketplace on their own website. So you don't have to go to OpenSea to trade Robotos anymore to buy one. Uh, you can just go to Robotos and you can, the Robotos and the RoboPets, which are their two main collections, uh, you can just do there, which I think, I think is interesting. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Uh, there's not a lot of projects that have yep. done this. Wearable's done this with at least five projects. There's certainly other companies mm -hmm. that do this, like, for example, Dapper Labs with Flow. I mean, it's, it's really designed for this type of thing. You have a collection, yeah. you create a yeah. marketplace. What are your thoughts on this in terms of an evolution? I, so, um, you know, having been on the other side of things, but having, I've had the good fortune to be in an interesting spot where I've been a creator of NFTs. I've been a collector of NFTs and I've helped to build NFT platforms and marketplaces. I think that it's interesting because you can, I think we can start to see a lot more innovation at the marketplace level. If you could zero in on specific attributes of an NFT. So I think that that marketplace could come up with some really, really neat mechanics that we don't even may not even be able to conceive of yet, whether those be um, different types of royalty splits, lending, trading, um, burning, combining, all sorts of interesting things that OpenSea and, and Rarible and all these other platforms could totally do, but not every NFT would be capable of doing that. So it's not, you know, it's, it's like when we saw Instagram emerge as a photo sharing app. It has it has a smaller feature set than most of the social networking products up to that time. It was, you know, there's a Facebook app, but people started using Instagram to take pictures because that's all it did. And it did it really well. I think that's the part of this that, that's really interesting is that creators of projects could start to add a whole nother level of, of features and functionality because they know they have this dedicated marketplace for themselves. I think collectors should like it too, because it creates tons of arbitrage opportunity. Like that's our, we're already seeing that with looks and Coinbase and OpenSea and even soul and, uh, you know, magic Eden and OpenSea or something. If I'm a, if that's my business is like flipping and day trading, I can jump between these platforms and do that. And, you know, whether, whatever, however you feel about that, I think that it's still sort of good because it keeps things happening. Yeah, and I think Robotos really fits this consumption or entertainment category over investment. Not, not that there hasn't been investors in it. Um, it's gone up and down. <clears throat> I think it's right now it's trading uh, maybe a floor about 0.3 or so, which is basically where it was last fall. Um, it was mm -hmm. it started out, I think they minted in August. It went up. Um, and then it came back down. The fall was in that, and then it went back up to an ETH, an ETH and a half, and then <clears throat> it's back down. But they have, uh, they're working on a TV show with time. Uh, they've got these games that are coming out. Uh, it's they're, they're developing personalities for a lot of the robot robotos. Uh, I kind of feel like this is the right move for them because they're creating this this branded <laughs> ecosystem. Mm -hmm. that I think is really interesting. Um, you know, we hear Gary talk about this idea that he's creating the next Disney. This is kind of mm -hmm. like a Disney or like a Nickelodeon show or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. They're creating all these properties around it. So why not? I think it makes a ton of sense uh, for them to have some more control over that because it's really weird that you send people to this place called OpenSea to get access to your, your community, which is your project, which is all the value emanates from mm -hmm. there. Um, why wouldn't they just come to you? In any other situation, they would come to your website, they would buy access to whatever it is you're offering, and they would stay yeah. right there. And it would be this whole self-contained scenario as opposed to going to this, you know, this weird third party that who knows what's going on there at any given time. Someone might be front running mm -hmm. Uh, the yeah. sale of NFTs that that are going to appear on the front page or something like that. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it's super interesting because I think we're all going into this space with what we 
it's like what happens with every new technology, right? You you take the experience you had before and you start building based on those assumptions of this is probably how people are going to behave. And as it starts to emerge and mature, you find new ways to do it. It it will be interesting to see. Yeah, if this becomes a if we end up with all of this stuff, right? Will there be custom marketplaces or will there will it end up being there's an there's an eBay and there's an Amazon and that's our future. Um, yeah, I, I think it's neat. I would love to see. I also think it's a, just a per, a awesome spot for innovation to occur, like both on the marketplace level and on the NFT level and how those two things might work together. Yes. I think we're going to see more of this. I think it actually makes sense. Yeah. So like why send people to some other place to buy your stuff when they're just going to be like exposed to all this other stuff? Because the, the, uh, the marketplaces don't care about you. They just they, no, they care no. about just selling whatever is available. And so, yeah, you, know, you might go there. Might go well, to they could, yeah, and there's your collection, but like, there's other things people can do there. Yeah, I mean, it's like the experience of two of that sort of absurd analogy, but like a brick and mortar, like going to the Apple Store versus going to Best Buy to buy an Apple product, right? that curated experience of the Apple store is, is just different. And, and some yeah. people, uh, it probably drives them crazy and just grates on them, but it's a very, it's a different experience with a whole different offering than if you buy it somewhere else. And I, I think that that, I mean, who knows what sort of neat collaborative or, or personalization allowing users to mint their own robotos based on, things they've done with their robots up to now. I think there's lots of neat stuff that could happen on a, in a marketplace like that. Yeah. I like it. Okay. So let's see, we've done PFP collection brands meme. That's also PFP, but it's more of a meme collection. Um, and then we have, I mean, this might not look like a fine art piece, but it is a fine art piece from Takashi Murakami. It's his flowers NFT project. Now, you may have heard of Murakami because he's a fairly famous artist that predates the NFT world, but also was involved in Clone X. And so I was working with the Artifact folks. There's a subset of the Clone X. You're in Clone X, so you would know this better than mm -hmm. I will. There's a subset of Clone X um, NFTs, which are like the Murakami versions and have some touch from him. I don't know exactly what that is. Um, so famous guy. I, I just thought it was very interesting that a couple things came up. So first of all, he did this mint. Um, it's a little over 11,000 in the collection. And it has a floor of right around four ETH. Um, so for an 11,000 collection, you know, from a fine artist who's not really offering a lot of utility or any utility, um, it's doing pretty well. Of course, he, would, he felt compelled to apologize to his token holders. Now, granted, like it's a four ETH. I don't remember what it mm -hmm. came out at. It was well below that. Uh, maybe one ETH or something like that, that they came out at. Um, it just dropped in March. I mean, it's only three months mm -hmm. later, but he's like, Oh, I'm so sorry that this isn't going up. <laughs> okay. Um, but then what happens? The community comes back. People start saying, not only is it not going up, you artist are sniping all of the rare L or all the rare ones. What's up with that? Uh, it's uh, this stuff is so hard to untangle at this point. Um, I, it's very weird to me that an artist would make something and then apologize for the price of it. I don't, I don't understand that at all. No, exactly. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't tracked this one enough to know if there was some sort of promise made or what, but that's a weird. Yeah. Um, I don't get that. In terms of them buying their own either. pieces, I don't necessarily have a problem with that either, to be honest, unless they're planning to do Actually, I don't know how I feel about that. That gets kind of weird. I don't know. Um, I, I think it's strange too. And I think this goes back to that conversation about um, about artists in particular. Are are they creating consumption items, entertainment mm -hmm. properties, or are they creating investment assets? Yeah. 
I mean, I mean it could was, be. Was Picasso if creating an investment asset? Was Van Gogh creating an investment asset? I mean, even even if you think about like Da Vinci or Michelangelo, who come from the patronage system, were they creating investment assets? I say no. No, I don't think so. I well, it's hard to say what when we go that far back. It's hard to know for sure. But yeah, I think it was different then, right? You art was different during the Renaissance, and its use was different, and it had. I mean, those were artists who were making things that were being purchased and displayed in in cathedrals and public settings and consumption items. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, and it was a. Yeah, but then when art became this notion of um, sort of self-expression, when the, the emphasis went towards that, and then art became this precious thing, not to say that it's not, valuing art is, is really just fucking art. By the me. way, art is um, not precious. Because no. if you look at it just overall, most art is worth nothing. There's just these outliers that are worth a lot. And there's a few things that are worth a little bit. So it's it's a perfect power law distribution. Yes. Um, the Murakami stuff specifically, it could be if he's apologetic that the floor isn't going up, which is just bizarre to me, unless he's explicitly told people it would. Maybe he's buying the rare ones because he thinks he's helping the community. You know what I mean? Like if someone the weird part about all this is we don't really know what the motivations of some people are and if they're doing it because he's investing in his own artwork or have you ever seen exit through the gift shop i feel like we've talked about this before the banksy film yeah sure it's great that to me is like it's got a lot of what's happening right now in it i think but it also has this really it's a really neat commentary on like what the hell makes art valuable um yeah i don't want to spoil it but if, you, if you're watching and you've not seen exit through the gift shop it's it's worth watching and it's especially yeah. if you're into nfts because i think there's some parallel stuff oh, more than the object that's super fascinating yes and i think um, that back to our back to that comment like well i know we talked about this before so i don't know if it's where we're jumping to next um the generative art kind of stuff. Oh, let's do that. Yeah. This feels like a good segue before I start. A cafe. More about. One of, one of several examples, but in case you've not used this folks, go to night cafe, just type in night cafe NFT. I don't remember what the URL actually is, but in that little box in the middle there, you can just type that you want a, um, a tank or let's say you want trees in a castle and animals and you want it in a cyberpunk style then you hit create and it actually creates something that looks like an expert using i'll call it procreate illustrator something like that put this thing together um it, a lot of them look amazing some of them don't but a lot of them look really really good and and there is a little bit of an art to writing the query oh absolutely what you want Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. But there's, but most of it's really just the system has some rules associated with it and creates spin stuff. art. <laughs> I, had a I had a teacher in art school that talked about that. Like, are you just making spin art? Which is like, you know, you put the paper in, the thing spins and you drip ink on it. Like, did you really do anything or did you just benefit from this technology? Yes. Because spin art is technology, right? Yes, but I think that there's a super where this gets dangerous is I think some of the stuff Art Blocks is doing and some of those artists is really fascinating and pushing the edge of things to me because it's They're a writing mix their of, own code. Exactly. It's a mix of it's a super fascinating mix. And I I think I worry that it gets lumped in with something like this, but Okay, so if you're using Night Cafe, let's just talk about Night Cafe. Yeah. There are some things you can do to make it your own. So, so first of sure. all, if you, you're, the query or the request you put in is going to be unique. Although I don't think that that necessarily takes artistic um, training or creative skill or anything. 
but uh, you could just get lucky or, but you know, there, there are ways to do that better. So you have to do that. The other thing you can do is once you export the file, you could actually take it into another system and you could update it, make changes, um, you know, add new brushes and make it more lustrous. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do to like, yeah, <clears throat> you're, you're starting with this DNA, which isn't unusual. I mean, people use, um, start from prints like of sort of ancient masters and then they do things with them. So that wouldn't be completely new. Um, but let, let's talk about this in the context of this type of solution versus art blocks. And there's two different ways mm -hmm. you can think about something, any, anything in the generative space. So in the generative space, you, you have to have your own algorithm um, mm -hmm. and you have to have a way to insert that algorithm into your contract in order for you to be able to generate these things. Um, and these are, this is a specific manifestation because the idea there is that these are being generated at the mint a time of mint. There are some other variants of this, but let's just stick with that for a moment. So we understand this idea of the artist creating the code that's going to generate the output. Yep. We understand this idea of someone else creating all the code, you just putting in some ideas, like so they mm -hmm. sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. Yep, yep. There's this other thing that happens in the art blocks community where some people have an idea for what they want, but they don't have the coding skills. And so they hire a developer to do that for them. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, and this could be applied equally well to Night Cafe. Yeah. Is the developer there a collaborator? Are they a co-creator? Or are they just executing a recipe that the artist has conceived of? And therefore, the coder is no more than a brush or a chisel in this case. It's just a tool of the artist. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, this is there's stories about this with artist assistants who who – end up exactly. doing a lot of the work, but the artist has already established the style and, and what they're doing. Um, I mean, it's all, it's all, it gets really gray when you get into the details of this stuff, right? Like, where do you draw the line at? But, and just talking about art is difficult anyway, because it's easy. It gets really slippery at some point. Um, well, if we think provenance matters, right? Yeah, um, I think it's an important question. And the other thing, too, just if you look at U.S. law in terms of ownership, mm -hmm. code is actually written work. That's how it's viewed. Yep. Um, therefore, the person who writes it actually owns owns it. Mm -hmm. um, you can't hire someone as an independent contractor and yeah. own their work. Um and then there's a lot of case law on this. If they're an employee of, of yeah. yours, then you can. Um, there's some sure. question about work for hire, but in general, what happens is most of the courts in the U.S. have sided with coders that they basically own that just as if they were mm. a writer and they'd written a chapter yeah. of a yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great to know who was involved and what their involvement is. In terms of what it makes it, so if 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 someone randomly does this and it looks good, does that make them an artist? Because this thing's so easy to use. But if Picasso did it, this is a big jump. If someone else, if Beeple goes in and does it, since he exists in the world today, and goes in and uses this, he's an artist. Did he just make art? Is he using it? You know what I mean? There's a Beeple's a good example because he works from libraries, right? So a lot of yeah. the uh, a lot of the elements of his pieces started somewhere else, and what he's doing yeah. is he's manipulating them, adding to them. Um, and but like I think there's a level of skill that might be different, and and this is going to be well, hard to draw the draw the yeah. line. Here, but well, and I, I also think craftsmanship is different than than art. So I'm adding a like conceptual art, like the idea, uh, the, the fountain, the, the Duchamp found the urinal he did. Yes. And it's like a famous piece of modern art. And oh. a lot of people are going to look at that and say, that's bullshit. The dude just took a toilet and set it on the floor. Like, come on. Or the guy taped a banana to the wall. Like, but that's a, like a. Okay. So, but they were the first people to do it. And, and yes, and maybe that's maybe that's more performance art than any other type of art um, that we would think about it. Uh, 
and, and I would say that someone who mints a collection at a night cafe with like maybe minimal intervention on what the output is, um, maybe they're important because they're the first ones to do it. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer yeah. is to that. Now, does the second I, person, what, but what if they're not the first person? But what if the first person that people yeah. know about? Does that mean then the first person who actually did it is really more important? I mean, this goes back to the idea of like crypto punks. Are they like, why are they valuable? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I think I've said this on this very show before, probably more than once, because I feel like it's a story I tell all the time. But I had a, when I was looking at 20, 20th century art, and I took this class at, in art school and I had done all the, you know, art history many times before that. And then you're looking at these new paintings and it's a lot of, you know, ab abstract expressionism and things that it's they're the type of paintings that when you go to the a museum, modern art museum with someone who doesn't know much about art, they might say like, my kid could draw that. Yeah, sure. And the, the thing my teach, I always liked a lot of that stuff because it was a neat way to see how, people use different techniques and how they arrived at an idea. And this instructor I had said, art is a conversation. Like all of art is this long conversation that's been happening for, you know, thousands of years. And when you walk into a room and see a Rothko painting without any context of how that got to where it's at, you're judging a conversation by hearing one little snippet of it and then writing it off. And I thought it was a neat, whether, whether or not that's accurate, is a really neat way to frame what's happening because that is a lot of artwork. So, and art, I also think is a series of, to know about it, you have to sort of, you have this experience of art around you. I heard this about jazz, a lot of jazz, like progressive jazz is some of the most complex music and incredibly satisfying if you know about music, but if you don't and you just hear it, it just, sounds really chaotic and, and yeah. unpleasant. But the more you learn about music and hear it, the more it becomes immensely satisfying. But if you haven't heard enough music and you hear it, it just sounds like noise. I think art is like that too. You seeing stuff that's familiar to you, but a little bit outside what you're used to is really satisfying. If it's too far outside what you're used to, you don't even, you can't even look at it and have an opinion about it because it's so out of your scope. So I think even the stuff that might not be art by someone who knows a lot about art is still good for someone who's interested in art and just learning about it and experimenting with these tools as an artist or experimenting with the the product as a collector of art i just don't know how but in between yeah. there there's all this opportunity for people to i think this is an important money. discussion because i heard someone make this comment recently about curating nfts and how it might it might give the collection more gravitas if they took an experienced curator from a museum and uh, they've, they've done all the right things. They know the right people. They know the right things, right? And that that would give more gravitas to the collection. And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, that doesn't seem right. I mean, I understand logically, I understand yeah, what you're saying. You're saying we yeah. live in something where we've already set up structures and metrics and rubrics for what's important, why it's important, and who gets to decide what's important. And we come to this new place. And of course, someone from that system would want to say, let's impose that system on this because of course it's good. I'm part of that system. Exactly. Yeah. I like that system. I understand that system. I come to this place and it has no system. It must be bad. And I was thinking, oh, geez, you know what? I've seen this before. When we were talking about the early days of the web, people were trying to enforce all of these things that were known about business and technology and the way things should be on these internet companies. And you know what it turned out to be? Wrong. Now, it wasn't that the people trying to do all these outlandish things in the, the internet and web world were always right, because some of them were these crazy things that just didn't make sense. And eventually they were called on that, unlike some of these artists who basically do ridiculous things occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, if you look at things like Amazon or Facebook, they shouldn't have existed based on what we knew in the past. If you oh, just totally. followed yeah. the playbook, yeah. And the, the fact that people said, no, 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 we're not going to do it that your way. We're going to do it a different way. Yeah. 
we have a different idea. And I kind of feel like we should be at that break point with the NFT world and that it should set up. Oh, its absolutely. Own yeah. And then maybe yeah. consider how those juxtapose with the old rules, but to try to, you know, to try to like force somebody in, in the NFT world, whether they're an artist or a collector to understand art history, I think it's kind of silly because it is a art. It is art. that's an expression of the moment as opposed to of all time. Yes. Yes. And it's, and it moves fucking faster than, than traditional art up to this point because, yeah. because of the internet, um, those we're already seeing that, that conversation thing I said, that's already happening with projects, right? Uh, MFers is a commentary on the projects that came before that it didn't, it couldn't have emerged from the start because it is, it's commenting on NFT projects up to that point, the way that Goblin Town is doing that. Now, yeah. in the midst of that, you have people rugging and hustle and scamming and all these things, but there's still art being made. Yeah, there's other people doing real art and they're adding to the, the yeah. you know, what you think of as the, is the, yes. is the portfolio of all art that's been created and some of it's very meaningful. I, like I think about like, yes. if you look at Replicator from Mad Dog Jones, like I heard someone tell me like, oh, like I know that style, that's such and such, you know, such and such has been doing that style mm -hmm. for a while. I'm like, okay, fine. I mean, like you, maybe it's similar to the style of somebody else. But when you look at Replicator and what they were doing with it and how it basically spawned multiple generations and things yeah. like that, uh, and then how it was implemented, not just as stills, but also with motion graphics and things like that. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely something new to the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, yeah, it's the rate at which what makes moments like the Renaissance possible is when you have lots of really talented people coming together and you suddenly have the ability for them to to communicate and and see what one another are doing right um that is happening right now so that the, there have been artists online making art and we've talked about this before for the last 20 years 25 years 30 years with internet stuff right and they've been getting sort of like they make their art it gets seen and consumed and they go about their day and now they're in a position to make money and now everyone is looking and because everyone's looking you have all these different disciplines coming together, making things, seeing what other people are making, and then making better things based on that. And that creates a moment in time where like lots of progress can be made very, very quickly. And we're still at the like very front of this thing, right? So I don't know. I we, we might that be. part's exciting. I, I I feel like we're at the front of it, but you never know. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the whole it, thing could explode, but we know that there's. I, I feel say like that. we're coming to the end of the beginning. Yes, I agree with that. But I think that there's this technology is going nowhere. Like it is absolutely here to stay. Blockchain. It's going nowhere, and then it's not going to disappear. As opposed to it's going nowhere, it's not going to progress. Right. So it will progress. It it's will not progress. Yes, I'm saying disappear. that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for. For that well yeah. that's okay i think i knew what you meant I, most people probably understood that but yeah I, was, I mean this is gonna be a it's here to stay right and if we yeah so regardless right. of all this all this volatility that's happening now we're in the 90s mid 90s of nfts or the fart app stage of nfts is the other one i was saying like when iphone first came out and there's all these goddamn fart apps before we had got anything useful like so that's yeah, where we're at when when alexa came out that was the first thing that got popular as well so yes. um and actually we, we were talking about uh 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 some sort of poop nfts recently oh that's what's yeah that's when i saw the piss and poop things off goblin it's like okay here's where we're at now i know yeah Okay. Um, this has been good. We're going to talk a little bit more in the future about like what fine artists should be doing and thinking about, because I think it's a completely different uh, concept of, of what we were normally talking about in the news of the day and things like that. But is there anything you want to promote today? No, I don't got anything off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Next time we'll give you the chance. Hey folks, go to niftorian.com. Uh, a couple things coming up. You should join our discord. Uh, we're going to be doing an NFT artist con. So it's going to be a conference just for artists to figure out like how to navigate the NFT space and actually giving them 
you know, advice based on being artists. And then um, we actually have Demo Day coming up for our NFT Artist Accelerator at the end of this month. Uh, so you actually have to be part of our community to get access. It's sort of semi-private. So uh, definitely go to nftorian.com and join the Discord so you keep track of all those things. And I think that's it. Scott Leach, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, folks. Until next week, happy hunting. <laughs>